this is time and this is the river flow and you have the cyclograph and let's suppose that it's a long sample so you have many years. So our first idea is okay let me split it. Okay. But I said that there are some problems. A second idea is let me isolate individual flood events, let's suppose that the model is conceived to simulate floods. So let me isolate individual flood events within this, so these are the flood events, within the cyberglass, and then I have another one here, and then I have another one here. Okay, let's suppose that I identify in this case four floods. So let me perform now a first validation by excluding one flood by chance. I perform the calibration of the whole series by excluding just one flood. So I'm not using half of the sample. I'm using almost all of the sample by excluding just one flood. And then I make the validation by reproducing that flood. And this is a first validation which is not very significant because it refers to just one flood. Okay, but it can be repeated for all the floods, meaning that once at a time you exclude a flood, you recalibrate the model with the remaining series and you check the model with that flood. So you can do the same check for all the floods and you get indeed uh, good information on model performances. This is jackknife, of course it's more computer intensive because it requires you to perform the validation many times. But today with the increasing uh, uh, availability of, uh, of computing power, then it becomes an interesting opportunity. How can we show the results of validation? Of course, they can be shown by computing the same statistics that I previously used as objective functions. So, the Nash efficiency in validation, the mean relative error in validation, the correlation coefficient in validation. So, in scientific papers, it is quite common to read, for instance, that the Nash efficiency of the model in calibration was 0.89. In calibration, it decreased to 0.75. So people give an indication of the Nash efficiency in calibration and validation, and one would expect that in validation it's lower. Because, of course, in validation the model is not trained to that particular flood. So this is one means to express the performances in validation. But usually, at least in, in the scientific research, we require that besides the statistics, one also show graphically, provides a visual inspection of the results. And the most typical graph that is shown is the comparison between observed and simulated idle. This is an example. Here you see that the observed data are the red dot, the black dots, while the um, simulated data, let's forget about the captions because media glue simulation, you don't know what is, but basically is model output, and uh, it's given by the empty dots. And also you have the uncertainty range, which still we don't know how to compute it. Let's concentrate on the black dots and the empty dots. This is comparison between observed and simulated, so people can see if for this particular flood the performance was good. This problem in the, this graph is the problem that you see just one flood, so typically people show the best one and you may have the doubt on uh, how well it performs with respect to all the floods, because as I said, typically people show the best one. And then usually we require more detailed graphs and a graph that is frequently used, I mentioned it before, is 
a visual inspection of the simulated discharge in this case, uh, river flow, versus the observed one. I already told you that ideally this, the perfect model would display points along the 1-1 line and by looking at the scatter of the points around the 1-1 line you get a very quick visual inspection of model performances and this is a graph that is frequently used. Another graph that is frequently used is the comparison between observed and simulated flow duration curves. I don't remember anymore if I introduced to you what a flow duration curve. Basically, it's the probability distribution of observed or simulated data. And uh, the, the comparison between observed and simulated flow duration curves is particularly useful if you are more interested in low flows than droughts. If you don't remember how it's defined the flow duration curve, you, you can see the definition. And I'm not insisting on the definition now because it's something that we will take into consideration later, I think so. And here you see some indications on what is a good model. I already mentioned to you the less efficiency. Here you have some more indication on the value of the correlation coefficient, the mean relative error, and so forth. But it's important to underline that it's difficult to say what is a good model. Because sometimes you are in a situation where you need a model, and if you need a model, you can also accept that the model is not really good, but still may be useful. So let's say that here we, we can say with this indication what is a good model. It's impossible to say what is a useful model, because it depends on your technical needs. OK. For model calibration, and validation, we are done.